is only part of it. Granted, at least they believe in the right God, and not some false moon God, or some Scientology God, or some Hindu God, or some Greek God, you know. I mean, my goodness. All right, uh, let's see here. Here's a story out of the Jerusalem Post. Romney says Obama threw Israel under the bus. And please, what, keep in mind, when I bring up stories from some Republican candidate, doesn't mean I'm endorsing them. I'm simply bringing you news, okay? Um, we don't know who the Republican candidate is going to be. Uh, frankly, I don't think I have a say in it. Uh, you probably don't either. Um, the powers that be that work behind the scenes, they're the ones that are going to put their man in office and we'll get to vote between the lesser of the two evils, basically. That's the way it always works, right? Um, anyway, Republican candidate says Obama disrespected Netanyahu and Gingrich reiterates that Palestinians are an invented people. Republican presidential hopeful Mitt Romney said uh, Thursday night, U.S. President Barack Obama threw Israel under the bus by designated the pre-1967 borders as a starting point for peace talks, while Newt Gingrich reiter reiterated his controversial remark that the Palestinians are an invented people. Um, Romney said Obama had disrespected Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu when Obama spoke at the UN, Romney said he raised the issue of settlement building but said nothing about rockets being fired on Israel from Gaza and during his State of the Union address on Tuesday Obama touted his credentials on Israel indicating his efforts to impose tough sanctions on Iran and saying our ironclad commitment to Israel's security has meant the closest military cooperation between our two countries in history. Yeah, whatever. Gingrich, who drew fire in December for calling the Palestinians an invented people, stood by his statements Thursday. Prior to the 1970s, he said, Palestinians simply considered themselves Syrian and Jordanian Arabs. Ah, uh, you know, I've had a lot of people ask me things like, can Christians be friends with non-Christians? You know, what what should we do? You know, the Bible says to not be unequally yoked. Uh, that's kind of more referring to don't marry an unbeliever. Um, but some people take it to the extremes and say, oh, well, he's not Christian. I can't hang out with him. You know, there are passages in the Bible that speak on this. Um, but Christians are called to love one another and to have compassion on them when they're hurting. And how can we do this if we cut ourselves off from them? I mean, look at Jesus. Jesus was God in flesh, a man without sin. Yet he came and sat and dined with sinners, tax collectors, and all kinds of people of Ill, Ill repute. Of course, everyone on the face of the earth is a sinner and in need of a Savior. Um, the Bible says that Jesus left heaven's glory and he walked among us, reaching out to those who needed to know God and to know that God loved them. Even when someone rejected him, as the rich young ruler did in Mark 10, verse 17 through 22, the Bible says he still loved them and wanted to be part of his kingdom, wanted them to be part of his kingdom. And one of the charges Jesus' enemies made against him was that he was a friend of tax collectors who were despised and assumed to be corrupt and sinners, Luke 7, verse 34. But at the same time, the Bible does warn us against becoming corrupted by the unbelieving world and living by its false values. The Bible warns us in James 4, 4, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Now, maybe you've never thought much about God and how he wants you to live, but God still loves you. He loves you so much he sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world to give his life for you, to save you from your sins and save you from hell. So, we are to go out and make disciples of all nations. How could we make disciples of all nations, as Jesus told us in Matthew 28, 19, if we don't get out there amongst the sinners and those who need to hear the word of God? We're called to this, people. It's a calling. Are you going to answer it? Are you going to sit back and say, I'm saved, I'm okay. Let them find God. You know, it's up to us, people. It's up to us to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ with everybody. With everybody. With everybody. Let's talk a little Christology. I've learned so much in this study. I hope you guys have too. Matthew 4, verse 12 through 17. In, in 17 it says, From that time Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
when Jesus heard of John the Baptist's arrest, Jesus returns to minister in Galilee, Matthew 4.12 tells us. Now, it's important to note that this new phase of ministry for our Savior <clears throat> does not enter Galilee immediately after his baptism. According to John's Gospel, Jesus has already spent time ministering in Jerusalem and Judea after his baptism in uh, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 29 through 42. In fact, the ministry of our Lord and his forerunner actually overlap in 3, 22 through 24, but only for a brief amount of time. When Jesus came to Galilee, he settles in a small village on the northwest edge of the Sea of Galilee named Capernaum, Matthew 4.13. Matthew tells us this fulfills Bible prophecy, specifically the words of Isaiah 9, verse 1 through 2, when the evangelist paraphrases in Matthew 4, verse 15 through 16. Now, the original setting of Isaiah's text helps us understand how Christ fulfills this passage. You know, Isaiah predicted that God would use the Assyrian Empire as his rod to judge the northern kingdom of Israel in chapter 7 and 8. And as was foretold, Israel fell and the people were exiled over a period of many decades, culminating in 722 B.C. or thereabouts. Uh, you can read about that in 2 Kings 15, 29 and 17, verse 7 through 23. But our Father also said, the sad state of people would not last forever. He said that he would raise up a son of David who would restore the glory of the nation, beginning first with a restoration of joy in the north. Isaiah 9, verse 1 through 7. In some sense, this began when the exiles returned to their land in 538 BC, but the full restoration had to wait for the coming of Christ. You know, the commencement of this light, and as we might say, the dawn, was the return of the people from Babylon. You know, Christ is the son of righteousness, Malachi 4.2. He arose in full splendor, and by his coming utterly abolished the darkness of death, 2 Timothy 1 verse 10. Since Jesus is ministering in the north and bringing God's light to a dark land, he must be the long-awaited Messiah who comes to restore his people. This is Matthew's point in 4, verse 12 through 17. Scripture often uses light to refer to the knowledge of God and obedience to him. Psalm 119, verse 105, and Proverbs 4, 18. As the light of the world, Jesus gives us true knowledge of our Creator. John 8, verse 12 tells us Jesus is the light of the world and he frees us from sin's oppression which makes us unable in and of ourselves to serve the Lord read about that in Romans 6 verse 17 through 18 this passage is a very powerful example of God's grace okay those who sit in darkness get to see the light not those who think they are in the light already you know Jesus came to call sinners to repentance not the righteous, Luke 5, verse 32. This doesn't mean that there are some who are righteous in themselves. It means that he saves those only those who confess their darkness and admit their need for his light, for his saving grace, for his salvation. So we need to understand that our desperate situation apart from God's grace is completely pointing us to the need of a Savior, a Messiah, how are we doing on time? Uh, let's talk about the antidote for fear. Psalm 27, verse 1, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? You know, fear is that dark cloud that enshrouds us and paralyzes us. Fear prevents us from trying something new or taking a risk. It imprisons us. It causes us at times to let opportunities just pass us right by. You know, sometimes we've all been victims of fear. Fear of rejection, fear of failure, fear of sickness, loneliness, the uncertainty of the future. Fear of going out of the house. You know, David certainly had plenty of reasons to be afraid. His enemies, including the powerful King Saul, were constantly after him. He faced death on the battlefield. He knew the pain of rejection and loneliness. David also knew that the remedy for fear was always with him. God Almighty. David writes, Whom shall I fear? Of whom shall I be afraid? David knew that the light of God's salvation would dispel the darkness of fear. God, as his stronghold and his anchor in this life, would provide him something to hold on to during the tough and difficult times when he was afraid. David could remain confident even when the wicked advance and war breaks out because God was his rock and protector. We need to be like David in that sense. You know, David could live with confidence because he learned to wait patiently for God. He waited for years for God's fulfillment of his promise that David would be king. 
He waited while his enemies were on the attack against him. It couldn't have been easy, but David never stopped trusting in God. You know, we all have fears. Some may keep you awake at night. Some dark cloud may prevent you from seeing clearly into the light and stepping out in faith. So we need to learn from David. Turn to God as your light and your stronghold. Wait patiently and confidently before the Lord. Let's talk a little spiritual warfare. Matthew 2, verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. You know, Satan was the real motivator behind Herod's actions. Ever since the Lord first prophesied that man would bruise his head, Satan has been seeking out this seed of the woman. Gen Genesis 3 verse 15. It appears that Satan is able to perceive when the Lord is making a major move in the earth. Okay, In the days of Moses, Satan moved Pharaoh to kill all the children of the Israelite slaves trying to get Moses. And here he motivates Herod to kill all the male children in Bethlehem. He was seeking to eliminate the seed who was going to bruise his head. Once again, today, we see children being slaughtered. Yeah, you're probably saying, well, where's this happening? Right here in America, millions every year are slaughtered. It's through abortion, which is murder. Think what you want about it. Call me whatever names you want, but abortion is murder, and it goes against God's will. Our youth are also being attacked in unprecedented ways. They Look where America is since they've taken prayer out of school. Do you think it's possible that Satan thinks that this generation is going to be the one to bring in the return of the Lord? Is he in desperation trying to stay off his doom by destroying this generation? We need to have enough spiritual perception to recognize that just as in the days of Moses and Jesus, this slaughter of the innocent children today is an indication of an even more important struggle in the spiritual realm. We're giving way to things that we know to be wrong. We know they're wrong, yet we allow it. Look how America is sliding downhill fast. We need to turn back to God and get on our knees and pray and repent. Second Chronicles 7, 14 all over the place. We are very likely to be the generation that sees the Lord come back. I praise God for that. We need to stand strong. Put on your armor. Oh my goodness, I got so much I want to talk about. You know, I told you the other day about this conference called Christ at the Checkpoint that's going on um, in Bethlehem, the birthplace of Jesus. And this event promises to be nothing more than an attempt to delegitimize the state of Israel and the biblical role of the Jews. I just feel it very necessary to continue telling people about this errant theological doctrine that drives all these efforts. You know, whether you want to call it preterism or dominationism or replacement theology, it doesn't matter because it's all from the devil himself. It's all a lie. It's all a lie from hell. And just as the name says, replacement, these are people that think that all the promises God made the Israelites in the Bible. These people think that God forgot that covenant, remembers it no more, and that now today's church has replaced the Jewish people as the chosen ones. That is a lie from hell. Okay, let me make sure I'm very clear on that. Replacement theology is a lie from the devil himself. Okay, the Jews are, were, and always will be the chosen of God. Whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not, they will be. There's a second covenant God made that's with the church. But these people, 